Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Alberto Rossi, a finance professor at McDonough School of Business and the director of the AI Analytics and Future Work Initiative. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, over the past decade, uh, we know we've seen an exponential acceleration in the use of uh, the new analytics and AI tools in the economy and the workplace. And the application of these tools is really changing how firms are operating, how markets operate, the skills needed to be successful, and how wealth is distributed across individuals in society. Uh, with different tools, these issues are studied across all areas of um, MSB, and in particular, the AI Analytics and Future Work Initiative is meant to promote the school's presence in three main areas. Uh, the first area, which I call promises and pitfalls of AI, we study the suitability of machine learning and automation across different domains in the economy. Uh, in the second, called uh, uh, Analytics and the Workplace, we study the implications of uh, technological advancements for employment opportunities and the skills needed by workers. In the third, um, called Digital Technology and Economic Growth, we study the welfare implications of uh, technology adoption. And today, I'm extremely excited uh, to have uh, Vlad uh, Babich and Igor Zaks talk to us about how technological advancements can promote international trade. Now, it's well known that small and medium-sized enterprises, or SMEs, account for approximately 43% of cross-border trade volume, but they are seven times more likely to be denied trade financing than multinational companies. Igor Zaks and his partners uh, are changing this with their company 40Cs. Uh, 40Cs leverages AI and data-driven technologies to extend the accessibility of working capital for small and medium-sized importers, exporters, freight forwarders and sourcing agencies. Now, before leaving the floor to our guests, Igor Zaks and the moderator, Vlad Babich, let me say a couple of words about them. Uh, our moderator, Vlad Babich, is the Dean's Professor of Operations and Information Management at Georgetown, where he specializes in uh, supply risk management, supply chain management, energy and sustainability, entrepreneurship, and uh, innovative technologies. And our guest, Igor Zaks, is the co-founder and chief risk officer of 40Cs, a fintech platform that digitizes and simplifies cross-border trade financing for SMEs around the globe. Igor is a seasoned finance professional with extensive experience in banking, uh, blue chip corporates, and consulting. And among many other roles prior to joining 40Cs, Igor held senior banking roles at Citibank, Daiwa, and Commerce Bank. But without further ado, let me leave the floor to Vlad and Igor. Thank you. Thank you, Alberta. Um, I would like to start by asking Igor to tell us more about 40Cs, about trade finance. Um, tell us what, what is going on. Thank you very much, Professor Babich and Professor Rossi for introduction. And let me share a few slides just to show a little bit what we do and maybe show a little bit live, you know, how does this look? Because one thing is to say about things, another is to show them in reality. So I'll share my screen and just show a couple a uh, couple of slides before we go to questions and answers. So that's a little bit about us and our team. Uh, so we were uh, backed by uh, Team 8, it's one of the major Israeli VCs. And our other founder is a very big logistics company named Zip. They're one of the top 10 container lines. Uh, here is our founding team. So. Uh, uh, one, uh, one of our co-founders uh, used to be a general manager of Payoneer, then our public company, about $2 billion, but we, they started as a startup and they uh, play a very big role in the payment space. Uh, another is our chief operating officer, Jill Schiff, uh, who, is, uh, uh, who had a lot of experience actually applying AI within marketing space. So he set up a company named Convert Media that was sold to Taboa. And the other co-founder is Suki Gawa, who is our co-founder based in China. And she's been with the uh, Ant Group, Alibaba, PayPal, Payoneer. So she has a, a real lot of experience on the ground within the space uh, in uh, China. And uh, for me, as I say, I already was introduced. So I had a mixture of experience within both banks, corporates, fintech, whatever. Uh, here is the problem we're addressing. So uh, we are working on a trade when both sides of this are not exactly matter multinationals. And if you look at international trade, there are general bottlenecks in international trade that apply to everybody, but smaller the size, more difficult it becomes. And one of the reasons is the international trade is very complex. 
you really need to deal with a lot of risk. You really need to deal with a lot of compliance. You really need to deal with a lot of documentation. So if you start looking at this, you find that it's very difficult. So I, when I used to manage it for $60 billion company, we have team, we have expertise, we have partners who are taking us very serious. So it's an easier task. But you go a little bit down and it's becoming a nightmare for many people. And that's what we are trying to address. We are trying to make people life easier so that we have a product that they can actually use. And obviously to do it, we need to first understand where the problems are and understand where the risks are. And second, we also need to apply appropriate technology to address it. So that's basically uh, how, uh, what is the core of our product. So one thing we do that is very different from what majority of the people do in this space. We do not start just with invoice. So if you look, for example, at products like factory or many banking products, they start when the invoice is already raised. Uh, we are in this sort of embedded finance space. When we are saying, we don't even need to wait until this. We can be part of your checkout. We can be part of the way you onboard the customer. We can do all the checks before. We can help you to raise invoice. We can help you to do it in a compliant way. Uh, we then uh, help people to choose the payment terms. We price this term. So again, all of this can be done automatically. All of this is API driven. Uh, we uh, uh, also link the bank account of the buyer. So instead of you know sending a whole bunch of chases and you know trying to allocate the payments, it's all connected. It's all reconciled. It's all done there. And when the invoice is due, it's paid, and then the process is gone. So that's uh, that's a little bit of a case study. So that's that's our client in China, and uh, we will we will show a little bit of how the actual process looks. So. This is basically how we onboard the client. So you, the client goes there, that's the checkout, that's actually hosted on the website of our client. And they say, okay, we want to get a payment term. The first thing we do, we identify the company. So we uh, allow the customer to go, we screen against appropriate databases on both compliance and credit side. We are checking, you know, this or what company it is, and there is a lot of layers that we do to do it right, but it's all happened in real time. And we are getting uh, credit. Now, uh, in our experience, we are on a smaller customers, we have a very large portion we can do, uh, apply instantaneously. But one of the things that uh, word of warning, there's a lot of people who say they're making instant credit decisions. Everybody can make instant credit decisions. The question is how often this decision is positive. Because if you don't have enough information, you will say no and it will be instant no. Now, we prefer to have a delayed yes and instant no. So when we can say yes, we will say yes instantly. When we cannot say yes, sometimes it can take you know a day or two. And with additional data, with additional tools, we can still make it yes. Again, with all the proper risk management tools. So we don't really advertise the fact we will make all decisions immediately. We will do as much as we can immediately. But we will not stop at this stage. We have a process that allows us to do a positive decision. Uh, what we do, what we do then, uh, you see, you see, you see here, it's basically going payment methods that were using before. So, and most of them were doing prepayment. So they will pay with PayPal or will pay with the credit card. We added the fact of our payment method. We say, if you want to do the terms, go to 40 C's. You choose the terms so you can put net 30, net 90, whatever terms will be. We immediately recalculate the, the cost that will be including all the financing costs. We ask people to sign the agreement that will mean that the invoice will be assigned and they will agree you know, on various things related to this transfer. That is a very important risk mitigation one. And once they press confirm, uh, basically the transaction can be done. Uh, so I'll show a little bit of video how it actually looks. That's actually done from our actual screen. So here they choose to pay with terms, they select the terms, it's all calculated, whatever terms they choose. They link bank account, that's very important part. So the payment will be directly debited from their bank account when the invoice is coming to be due. That's how the, the, the pricing is taken into account. Here are the agreements they're going to sign and they scroll, need to scroll it and they confirm it.
And now we can see the status. So right now it's pending, then will be approved, and then uh, you know money will be collected, and both buyer and supplier can see real time everything that's happened with the invoice. So it's a very simple, very straightforward process that allow companies that does not even need to have a very sophisticated uh, credit collection department or other uh, to uh, do what they need to do. Uh, that, that, that basically how the documents look when they are there and people can download the copy and uh, uh, they're all stored in the system. That basically what it's uh, working. Uh, now we find very, very positive reception of the product because one thing, it does not create a headache. The problem in my view, the biggest problem with trade finance is a headache. It's a lot of additional work, a lot of additional process, a lot of necessary skills that required from the company to be able to do it. For us, it's built into their process. We don't try to them to go on our process and you know do everything. We built it around their process. We do it in a way that works with them. At the same time, we are very, very keen on making sure we manage the risk. So we think about user experience, but not at the cost of taking unreasonable risks. Now, important, we are going on the other side of it. And the other side is on reverse. Because if you are, for example, a company in US, and say you want to order certain things you want to be produced in say, China or Vietnam, you go to the supplier and supplier will say, oh, pay me 30% up front and the rest pay when you ship. And you need to carry inventory. You have, you know, your own working capital cycle, your cash conversion cycle going out of the window with this type of uh, process. So it's very difficult for you to do it. You ask the company to extend credit to you and the company will say, first, we don't know what is your risk. It's very difficult to assess. Second, we need to have our working capital managed ourselves. So, and third, if you start using something, it's very difficult. Again, you know, there are options people can do. They can go, go for example, for letters of credit, but that's, again, not, not cheap. And it's a very uh, difficult to make a compliant document because, again, you know, people think the letter of credit provides you perfect security, but you make a small discrepancy in document and your whole security is just not, don't exist because discrepant documents, nobody is, obliged to accept uh, people use credit insurance and you know people can go to sign issue or you know other provider you know in the country but again you know dealing with insurance is a separate one we, we use insurance by the way uh, we partner with one of the big insurers part of our process but we have a whole framework how we manage it how we what controls we put and things like it it's very difficult for a small client to do the same and then we have two other very very interesting niches that we are working one is a sourcing agent and that becoming a very, very important business today. Uh, and the sourcing agents, they basically help the company to find and to manage their suppliers. So if you need to, to order something, very unlikely you will manage to uh, actually get a supplier, say, in China or Vietnam. Because first, you need to know who they are. Second, you probably need to have people on the ground who will visit their facility, who will check the production, who will check the quality, who will do all the things. So these people provide all the services. But again, you look at the working capital, it's very challenging because they, they, they do not have massive capital and the supplier is not going to extend a lot of credit to them. From the other side, the buyers also don't want to prepay them. They want to get some credit terms. So there is a big uh, bottleneck there. And again, we, are, we can go on both sides of it. So we can work with the sales, say, inside the United States or Canada or other places. So they have a company based in whatever Texas and they want to sell to a buyer based in New York, we can, we can definitely finance this sale and we can finance the sale from say Vietnam to them. So we can deal with both parts of it. And because we have visibility, we can be much more sophisticated in assessing the risk and providing the service. The other very interesting part for us is straightforward. Again, you know, having one of our shareholders and you know, finance providers, one of the biggest logistics companies, we have a lot of interest in logistics. Now, logistics also need finance. You don't want to pay in advance for the whole logistics. By the way, if you look at United States, or the biggest area of factory in the United States, actually transportation service, the domestic transportation. But we are not even in this. We are in international freight. The other thing, the freight companies, they have access to customers. They have access to information. 
And it's a very good value added for them to provide also some services on financing what they do. And several logistics companies try to do it with a mixed success uh, before, but we actually do a complete integration with some of the companies that allow them to do it with both of their own uh, sales, i.e. the freight services and the customer sales, the inventory they do. Uh, now we have a two-sided model and uh, we are on both exporter and importer side. And that's again, different from many platforms that just have a heavy focus on just one side of it. And eventually we are looking to add a lot of different services on both sides uh, that can make life easier for both exporters and importers. Uh, and here is one interesting observation about uh, the uh, marketing that we do. And what we start seeing is what name a flyview effect. And I'll tell a real story. Uh, so uh, some time ago, we have a supply in China and they actually introduce it to the buyer who is buying from them in Canada. Now, we finance the sales, it's going very well, we continue business there, but then the Canadian buyer is saying, oh, we also have supply in Korea, can you finance this sale as well? Okay, we look at this and we do it and both both of them are happy. They're not competing in terms of, you know, what they do. Everybody is happy there. Now we have another one. Now we get the supply in Korea going to us. And they say, oh, we have another buy in the United States. Can you finance this? So, so as a result, we just go more and more with the NECA system. And that's a very good effect. And that's one of the big differentiations in the way that work for us. And obviously for this, you need to have a very good feedback from your customers because when people introduce you, they need to be very positive about what they do, their reputation. But that's, that's exactly why we are so focused on user experience. That's a little bit on a tech stack that we have. So we develop the, the importer dashboard and exporter dashboard. So we're providing uh, real good real time information on both sides. We have a white label checkout that could be incorporated in the customer side. We are dealing with a payment framework. We are dealing with legal framework. We have uh, compliance regulation. We do obviously necessary integrations and underwriting. We do workflow management. So that's broadly how it's uh, working. Now, uh, here we get a strategic partnership with a company named Zim. So they're leading global carriers as one of the top 10 uh, container companies in the world. They also have a subsidiary named Ship Forward that is a freight forwarding subsidiary and we integrated with them as well. That's a little bit of a market side. So if we are just looking at a trade between China and US and we're only looking at SMEs, 153 billion. We add a few markets in Asia and we just not even go on outside of it. We already have close to 200. You add European markets, you add Canada and you, you start going to like half a billion of trade. And I'm not saying about total trade, I'm saying about addressable market within SMEs because obviously there is no particular benefit we can provide if you want to do trade between, uh, I don't know, a subsidiary of Procter & Gamble in one of these countries and Walmart. We are focusing on a different uh, segment. And that's basically it from a presentation uh, point of view that I am, promise I will keep very, very short. And now we can talk about any questions about, you know, what we do, how we see the market, what we see, you know, that people need to pay attention to and things like it. So back, back to, to Vlad. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Very, very enlightening. Um, I want to dig deeper into some of the uh, points that you made and maybe um, um, expand on the fundamental ideas where the value is being added, what are the uh, pain points that are being overcome and what are the opportunities that that creates. Um, so the trade finance, um, you know, Georgetown is a global school and uh, I think it cannot be more appropriate for us to talk about global trade finance, such a, such a perfect match. So trade, trade finance, global trade finance have existed for millennia, right? It's uh, always been a difficult, a challenging task. Um, you described how complex the process is, just the number of participants is, is, is amazing. Um, wh why do you think, um, well, it's an important part of 
global trade. But why has it been so difficult and resistant to solutions? What, what are the opportunities that uh, um, came up now that make it possible to solve this problem better? What do you think? Okay, so uh, there are a lot of parts to this question we could discuss it for days. So I will try to be brief in answering it. Uh, and fundamentally, I think there is one big change that happened in today's world comparing with the world that was several thousand years ago. And what happened several thousand years ago, it did not change much until very, very recent, is there were no information flows of any reasonable quality. So if you don't have information flows of any reasonable quality, what you need to do, you need to really simplify. You need to make it that simple rules that everybody can comply, that may have very little relationship to reality. But if you deal with this as very, very simple rules, you are able to conduct the trade. So let's look at a traditional trade finance that, uh, that is still done. So letter of credit. What's the idea of letter of credit? There are two ideas. Idea, idea number one, you don't deal with the contract, you don't deal with the relationship, you deal with the document. So doctrine of strict compliance. So you have UCP 600, you present a document that is standard of examination, is it meted or doesn't meet it. If it's meted, doesn't matter what happened in the real world, you pay, and if it doesn't meet, you don't pay, unless acceptance is accepted. That's, that's one part of the structure. And again, here is the problem. Getting from your real world to this world is not that simple because you don't produce exactly compliant documents. You are not paid. Even you, you, you done what you're supposed to be doing, contractual and all the stuff like it. That's one part. The other part is that financial institutions generally don't trust companies in terms of the structure is done. So again, how the letter of credit is working? You need to have two banks. You will have issuing bank and you will have confirming bank. And the banks deal between themselves. They have swim, they exchange messages between themselves. They send the documents to each other and one deal with the supplier, one deal with the buyer. If you look at factoring, you're going to broaden the same idea. So you have two factor model. Again, the cross border is not happening. Now, make perfect sense 100 years ago when there were very, very little information flows, very difficult to do. But today with degree of integration in supply chain, it's not really rational. You have much better ways of doing it and you can integrate into this flow. So that's, that's in my view, fundamental difference that you start seeing. And again, uh, you have the areas that become prominent and prominent as a bank product. But again, what the banks do today, banks are serving their customers. Banks are not global anymore. Few that try to be global become less global now. And banks are focused on their customer. So if my customer is Walmart, am I interested in serving Walmart? Yes. If Walmart telling me I need to, to finance Walmart supply chain, I will put the necessary resources to go and I may even go to some smaller suppliers and I will do onboarding. Probably as a bank, I will not be capable, but there are platforms, there are various type of supplier the products that allow to onboard it. But would I like to do it for say a smaller and more risky customer? No, because my focus is to, to provide a service to my nice global customer. The same on, a, on, a, on the side of supplier. Now, if I am IBM, would uh, people like to provide financing to my distribution or whatever, or Ford or whatever? Yes, have a scale, People will go there. So generally speaking, in the areas where there is a size and there is a deep integration, it starts developing as a banking product. But in a, in a small one, just banks are not, not uh, geared to do it. And, and, and that's why in our view, there is a massive opportunity for platform. By the way, the only financial institutions we find that are still global and, and have to be global are people like credit insurance because they actually have presence everywhere. But you look even at the banks, we used to work for Citibank, was the most global bank, and they withdrew from several markets. You know, uh, HSBC is just exiting Canada right now. I'm not even saying about, you know, some emerging markets. So, so the banks generally uh, 
and that the long period started about 2008 and it's continuing and continuing now, they start to become more local. And we still have global trade, we need to do it. So that's probably not, not answering all the aspects, but you know, I just touch on a few and we can continue the discussion for a long time. So it seems, so the continuing with this uh, topic of integration of data and new data that's coming up. Um, so what data is essential for you to have to be able to provide the services? What kind of information would you need to co collect and how, how do you collect it? So uh, if you look at the technology and what we are able uh, to get, there are a couple of trends that become easier recently. One, there is a development of open banking. And development of open banking means we can actually see bank transactions. We can see what is happening on a bank account. That's the real time information. That's not an old financial that are there. And that's good. And that can be combined with also ability to debit the cycle. So we can actually see what's happened. And there are various data tools, uh, including, you know, using various machine learning techniques that allow, again, I don't believe there is a magic tool that allow to make credit decisions. When we are saying, we are saying more ability to classify the stuff, ability to go through thousands and thousands of various things and interpret what they are. So the tools, for example, we use, they allow to reconstruct some type of quasi-financials, like PNL type of things, out of transactions that we can go on the banking side. Again, they're not perfect, but they're very complementary. We do look at our financials. The other thing now, there are tools allowing to link into the financial system. So if somebody is using QuickBooks or NetSuite or whatever, there are tools now allowing a real life connection to the real accounting data. That's obviously important. Uh, there are a lot of technology being developed on compliance side that again, allow to detect fraud, that allow to uh, monitor all the different type of sanctions and political exposed persons and all the different things. And again, that's making life much easier because a lot of this is now sophisticated technology that is uh, used. And then for sure, uh, uh, there is a lot of logistics data because logistics service providers are now much more sophisticated than they used to be. And again, you can see a lot of information related to what's happened with the goods and things like it. Again, none of this method is perfect. None of them is allowing you to just, you know, take a magic wand and make decisions. But definitely we are in a situation when there is much more available. Now, uh, and by the way, I will say a word of caution, like uh, we, uh, in terms of machine learning and things like it, there is always this question about calibration and training set, because uh, a lot of people try to say they have this magic wand and they're able to do everything. Now, to me, there is always the question, uh, what, what are you calibrating the models, how you do it? And to me, there are tasks that are achievable because it's easy to calibrate and that there are things that people do. If somebody talents that, for example, they can absolutely perfectly access, you know, probability of default or something like it, I don't think we are there yet. Uh, we are in particular industry, in particularly granular data coming to a lot of support tools. But again, you know, one need to be realistic. The things are going step by step. I think we make a lot of giant steps. I think with a lot of areas, we achieve a lot of progress, but we are not yet at the stage when uh, everything can be completely automated and you still need a lot of expertise. And one other observation I think that's a general observation is people start talking about solutions. First, you need to understand what are the problems and we look and we understand the risk, we understand the things that can go wrong. So we are trying to design our solutions around the things we understand is a problem. Unfortunately, what we see sometimes that people create a solution and it just going around the wrong problem. So we, again, we are trying our best not to go to the trap. Speaking, speaking of risks, so what are the, right, the, the, the way when I learned finance, I know finance is about uh, risk managing risk on one side and uh, managing returns on another side. So let's talk about the risk part first. 
Um, so what are the major risks that you have to worry about when you step into this middle of the transaction between importers, exporters? You know, what, what are the things that um, you need to worry about? What are the risks? If you start looking at a trade finance transaction, that's interesting because trade finance is a little bit different from, for example, lending. And the difference is you have three types of risks. Unlike lending, when you have broadly speaking one type of risk, credit risk. The risk number one is the same as a credit risk. You sell the goods and the customer go bust and don't pay. That's a credit event, that's a credit risk. Uh, this is sizable risk. Uh, in my view, the easiest risk to manage because there are ways to assess this risk, there are ways to outsource this risk. You know, for example, credit insurers and others, you know, there are various tools you can use to mitigate this risk. The other risk is performance risk. And the performance risk is you sell the goods and you're not paid, not because the customer go past, but because there is some type of issues or disputes related to what you provided. And then you're going into some type of dispute resolution and can take time and money to resolve it. And then there is a third risk that is a behavior risk. And again, if you're in a company and you sell and you sell at 30 day terms, you may be paid at 30 days, you may be paid at 40 days. It's nothing to do. Nobody's saying you did not provide what you did, or what you're supposed to do. There is no dispute. There is no credit event. You know, uh, I remember at some point when I was in a very major company, my biggest overdue was from a triple A company. And the reason was for AAA company because they were AAA, but very bureaucratic. You supply to a lot of remote locations. And by the time they confirm, they get the goods internal and the treasury do the payment and stuff like it. You know what? You, 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 you get to 60 days overdue. Uh, and uh, nothing to do with the credit risk, nothing to do with disputes. So that's the three risks you have. And you always need to manage this sort of three risks. Now, in our structure, what we do, we are only financing when there is no dispute. So we ask the seller to confer to the buyer to confirm directly to us that there is no dispute related to this transaction. With the payment delay, again, we debit directly with the, uh, the bank account. Now, is it possible they will not have money at the time of a debit, despite the fact we send an advance warning? Of course, there is a possible chance it will happen. But that's not happening that often. And uh, here we get to the discussion that was a Nobel Prize in economics for uh, uh, by, uh, this, this, the professor that wrote Nudge, uh, Nudge uh, Tuffler, whatever, from Chicago Business School. And his whole concept, uh, concept was that what you set as a default determines your behavior, even if you have right to change it. So if your default is things are paid on time, they will be paid on time. If your default things will be paid when they will be paid, they will be paid when they will be paid. So if you look at a structure, there are legal ones, there are setup structures, there is like what, what again, what you can name choice architectures uh, that you do, and it determines the behavior. So and, and that's sort of broadly speaking where, where, where you deal with the risk. And then of course, like there are a lot of specific mechanics and specific tools you use in each of them. Interesting. Um, so, kind of getting really into the nitty gritty details, um, just to go through the example that you gave, that you show the customer, you give them an option to pick the payment terms, is it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and you're pricing it on the spot. Um, how What's the what's the algorithm for repricing it? What's the uh, I, I'm not asking for the logic per se, but kind of at the high level, what do you need to know to be able to price it? Is it the same for every customer, or are you customizing it for each individual transaction? These numbers that are come out coming out. Okay. So your question is whether we do risk based pricing. The answer not currently. The second question, do you make a, a price independent on a type of relationship, type of volume, type of history? Yes, you do. 
Risk-based pricing is a very tricky thing. It's very tricky. It's very difficult to manage. Because what do you do, what do you do then? You like there are people who try to do it. And what do you do? Okay, you get a model. It show you know you have a probability of default of zero point two five percent. You price out of this. Then you run the model again. It shows zero point five eight percent. You reprice it immediately. You go to customer saying, okay, you know, I mean, it's just very, very impractical to manage. So uh, are there potential tools that allow to do it? Yes. Is there a practical way of managing it from point of view of customer experience, explaining it to supplier, explaining it to the buyer, you know, changing it all the time, avoiding disputes? It's becoming very difficult to manage. So my view is you can do everything. You just need to think whether on a cost benefit it's uh, there. So you obviously need to look at a portfolio basis and you need to see that your funding cost plus your expected losses plus your cost to manage minus you know uh, whatever revenue you have leaving you something. If it doesn't leave you all the way around, I mean. If it doesn't leave you, you know, some reasonable profitability, you're not you're in the wrong business. But do you do it on a portfolio basis or do you do it on individual basis? It's a very tricky question. And my my own observation, you don't need to overcomplicate things. So continuing with this theme of the challenges that um, still remain to be addressed. Um, is this the largest challenge that uh, remains to be addressed to make the trade finance uh, simple? Or are there any other ones? Is there anything that worries you? Or is there anything that you wish you had as a tool, as data, as an arrangement between the companies that would uh, help uh, to make the trade finance better? Absolutely, absolutely. And again, for us, we at the beginning of the journey, we pick an area that in our view are easiest and there is a very good return on addressing them. There are things that are going on the next level and we are going to address them at some point. Because again, we try to isolate, broadly speaking, a credit risk element. So we go when there is no disputes and things like it. If you look at actual trade finance, you have tons of other risks that need to be financed and not enough data to manage it. Because it reminds what I started. If you get the supplier in China and the buyer in the US, first thing Chinese supplier will ask is the prepayment. Why they need prepayment? Because they need to go through manufacturing, they need to buy parts, things like it. Now, here is a question. That's a risk of the supplier. And that's not exactly a financial risk. It's a different type of risk. Can, uh, can one manage the risk? Because we are saying we don't finance this part. We can finance the 70% that are going after the goods are ready, and we can finance it for whatever you know period is necessary. We can, cannot deal with the first one. Can we do it? Can we do finance of inventory? And again, there are some tools for finance of inventory. And these are all the parts that are going into a lot of data. And there are some areas when the data are available and there are some data that are not. So again, if you look, for example, at inventory finance, in a hard commodity space, it's that simple. It's very standard product. Because if you have oil or you have you know, some metal, you, can, you have a whole bunch of statistical data. What are the prices? It's trade on exchange. It's that simple. So you need to make a right haircut and you can exactly look how do you do it. How do you do the same if you are getting a part for mobile phones that are, you know, uh, like chips? They're going out of date. They're non-standard. You don't know enough about the market to understand how they're going. Uh, much more difficult. Can it be done in some areas? Yes. Is it easy to do? Much more easy in some parts than in others. And again, once you gain experience within certain supply chains, you learn, and on this learning curve, you can start applying all the different tools to do it. Manufacturing is the same thing. Operational risk generally is far more difficult than financial risk. It's exactly why, for example, with letters of credit, they remove it completely. They just make sure it's about document. It's not about real life. Do we have more data now on real life? Yes. 
do we have a lot of data available with actual events? Because you need to see the trigger event. Like if you want to do some, some bankruptcy, you need to have enough bankruptcy in your data set. If you want to see an example of a closed dispute, you need to have a lot of quality disputes. You need to understand, have a proper record, a proper data model, how they are all recorded and things like it. That's a very, very difficult part. Can it be addressed over time? Yes. And that means that you can do, and again, with integration, with more, more, much more data exchanges, this thing is getting more there. Now, today I see this uh, area is being addressed in some of the closely integrated supply chains between people who are in a very, very neat manufacturing cycle and there is this data really available. Can it go back to you know small, medium-sized companies? It should over time. We are nowhere near to it now, but that's something that will make the market very different. It will mean that we can actually work with completely different sets of risks and provide completely different set of finance. So to me, uh, there is enormous room and, and uh, for improvement. We are going for low hanging fruit and right or so, but are we going to go farther? Yes, over time. So there is a question from the audience that uh, uh, preempted my own question along the same lines. So this morning I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal that despite the tensions between China and the United States, the trade between the two countries continues to grow. But there certainly is a concern about the international events, about the sanctions, um, a regu regulatory risk. Um, so the question that uh, comes from Francesca, do you need to put protocols and procedures in place to avoid the risk um, that the application might be used to sidestep international sanctions for foreign operators by the US? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, now, now, now this area of, of technology developed a lot. There are a lot of providers that will have very, very regular and detailed updated list of all the different type of sanctions. And I'm not only saying about the US ones, I'm saying about you know all the relevant countries. And you also have other like, political exposed persons and sanctions like it. So there is a whole bunch of different things that are going there. And uh, yes, we deploy uh, technology. We deploy you know one of the sophisticated providers that provides a fully detailed screening on this. I mean, as we should. And then on top of what we do, uh, there are also other, other parts of control because obviously, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not relinquishing in any way what we do and we are doing it and we deploy appropriate tools, but also then you have other, other layers because for example, you need to provide payments. We are still doing payments through a normal banking. So banks obviously have also run their compliance and things like it. So while we obviously do our filters, there are additional layers on top of, this. And we deploy, we, we deploy an industry standard tool used by a lot of financial institutions, you know, to, to do it. But other people also provide additional layers. So we have very little interest in, you know, helping anybody to, you know, avoid sanctions or whatever. And we are taking very active steps to, uh, to avoid it. Uh, now, on, on uh, uh, additional ones, uh, generally speaking, it's not very common within the space we do that actually sanctions are a big issue. Because again, we are mainly a small and medium-sized business. Now, uh, most of the sanctions, I'm not saying we don't do checks, we do checks and we do it every time. But most of them would affect, you know, a bit larger entities, you know, state-owned enterprises, you know, people link it to some big, you know, groups uh, and things like it. So we, we are not there, you know, to, to uh, finance, you know, supply of uh, defense-related equipment uh, by some big state-owned enterprise because that's not the segment we are even uh, in. So while we obviously do the controls, to, to, the, to the secondary question, is, is there a large impact? Not huge in our case because this case is not often finding it within the space we do. But do we need to do controls? Absolutely, and we do it. Thank you. Um, 
incidentally, as uh, the audience members might have uh, gathered, um, you should feel free to ask any questions in the Q and A, and uh, um, eager and. I, if I know the answer by chance, will try to uh, uh, give an answer. Um, so one of the questions um, I had, we'll come back to the question about uh, learning about how trade finance works. Um, you are a global international company. Does that present any particular challenges? Um, does that present any particular opportunities from your perspective? I mean, Defento makes me to sleep less because of the time differences. <laughs> so, uh, no, I mean, I mean, uh, opportunity, of course, because uh, to me, cross border is where a lot of opportunities are, because a lot of people just don't have expertise outside of the own market. So you sit in U.S. or you sit in Vietnam, doesn't matter. You know very well what you what to do with your next door neighbor. You have a lot of challenges, or, uh, and they're all the different type legal framework, uh, cultural language, whatever you know, to deal with somebody there. Now, if we deal with a company in China, we'll have people in China speaking with them in Chinese, knowing exactly all the local regulation, local culture, you know, local business practices. Uh, so, no, no, no one who are the main players, no one, you know, what reputation they have. And that's really important because if you sit, say, in Washington D.C., you may not necessarily uh, have it, and, and vice versa. If you if you are in U.S. or in Canada or in other place, so uh, being global is, in my view, extremely extremely important. Does it have challenges? Of course, because uh, again, you need to deal with all these problems. Now, hopefully, we are dealing with them more efficiently than other people deal with this. But you know, is it is it simple? No. Um, so maybe let's uh, see if we can address question from Michael Rove. Is there any materials you would recommend to study to become more familiar with how trade finance works? Um, I know I mean, there, are, there, there, are, there are there are bunch there are a bunch of books and uh, I get a couple of friends of mine who managed to write the books, but I don't remember their names. But like I'm sure you know if you start looking, you can find a lot that are covering traditional trade finance, you know, letters of credit, things like it. So it's plenty of these. Um, uh, the area, if you look at a more modern thing, the area is evolving very quickly. Uh, so uh, I, I mean, you really need to look at, uh, you know, the publications and things like it. Uh, there are uh, some, the, there are some places that uh, provider like you have you know uh, TRF news you have trade finance global you get uh, you know place to like GTI you know uh, and they all provide various type of uh, publications uh, uh, so I for example contributed to several yearbooks about you know factoring and supply chain finance and others and so did many other people um, uh, so there are uh, uh, there is a very uh, uh, a number of oh, like international chamber of commerce produced several guides. Uh, so there are there are various type of things. Is there like a textbook on it? Yeah, on traditional stuff. Yes, if you start going on and you want it so much rapidly developing that you really need to keep your eye on uh, you know various things that are happening. Um, um, there's a question from Cheryl. Uh, asking about the recent IBM discontinuing the trade uh, platform, trade lens. Um, how does it affect 40Cs? Um, what can 40Cs learn from their failure? Uh, by the way, trade lens is not the only one. There is another one also relate, related to IBM that was V-Trade, that was specific on trade finance. Because trade lens was not a trade finance, it was about more and information about the physical flows. We trade was actually a platform that uh, also was hyper ledger based and it was for trade finance. So the, uh, there is another one also TradeX who is doing the same and things like it. Now, uh, uh, and, and there are ones that are still, still, still working. Now we can go to a very long discussion why, but I will put one, one, one small thing, you know, just, just to address. There is a thing named network effect. And if you want something to work, it needs to become accepted by sufficient number of players. 
point to have value. If it doesn't accept by enough value, so 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 uh, like in game theory, Bitcoin illustration of a prisoner's dilemma, because uh, what is in interest of everybody is not in, is not necessarily in interest of individual player, and uh, and that's why it's come 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 in fundamentally. So you create this sort of standard. Uh, the, then if not enough people join it, it's not going to be there. And now you have another thing, and that's that's a little bit to do with uh, trade lands, a little bit to do with, for example, Libra, that was cryptocurrency project by Facebook, a little bit to do with others. Blockchain was a, was designed to address the question about lack of trust. That, that's what it's done. Now, if you have a so-called blockchain product sponsored by a major player, now, if you if you trust people, you don't need blockchain. If you don't trust people, blockchain uh, uh, will only help if nobody have control. If you try to combine the two, to me, it's a little bit strange solution in many cases that just, you know, people who want to go there because of lack of trust are not going to go there. And people who go there because they think it's operational efficient because blockchain is not a good database. Like if you want to go to electronic bills of, of Leiden, uh, go to Wave, go to Balera, and they're all central. And, and you get somebody with a good reputation keeping, you know, a nicely managed central database. Uh, to me, with a lot of these projects, I don't understand what problems they were addressing. And that's sort of my personal view based on a limited knowledge of why, why, why they did not scale. Would it, would it be possible at some point they will be? Yes, and you have successful examples. Most of successful examples, like in Singapore, was with the government mandate. Because then, then you don't have a choice. Would you get easy uh, getting into this sort of network effect by voluntary people joining? Possible, but very challenging. So it's my understanding, kind of building up on this question about trade lands and the, in the answer, um, that the, the network effect the, was a challenge because um, Maersk uh, and IBM who partnered up is obviously a major uh, shipper, right? And other shippers yeah. had concerns sharing the data about their customers essentially with their potential competitor. Do you face a similar type of challenge? Do you face a similar type of constraints, right? So I see the 40C's strength in having these partnerships with multiple kinds of companies, insurance company, yeah. shipper, uh, financial institutions. Yeah. Um, do you need to keep on partnering? Do you need more partners to keep on growing? Or is there some other way of overcoming this challenge? I mean, again, we do keep partnering and we go for multiple partnerships. That's, uh, that's correct. But again, we are in a slightly different space. For us, we are dealing with thousands and thousands of small and medium-sized businesses. We are not in the business of trying to go to several very, very major companies because that's where trust issue is. Why, 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 why if uh, your customers are, you know, 10 logistics companies, and they're your whole customer base, then, you know, you're herding cash. If you're a customer of the 10 major banks, you're herding cash. So, uh, so for our, in our case, that's less of concern. We don't need network effect in the same way. Because at the end of the day, for us, if we provide a nice bilateral link between the people, they're all happy. So it's a less of concern in our business model. Uh, network, net, network effect businesses is, is a great thing that they have massive potential and massive chance of crashing. I think we have massive potential and less chance of crashing. I mean, <laughs> I hope so. So um, we are almost out of time, but I couldn't uh, let the conversation go without asking the question about entrepreneurship. Um, so I know that uh, either you worked for major companies but you also uh, started uh, a number of your own companies and 40 C's, uh, you know, you're one of the founders. So do you have any advice to aspiring entrepreneurs? What to do, what not to do, what is hard, what is easy, what's surprising? 
I mean, first entrepreneurship is not easy. And uh, uh, it's very easy to get frustrated working, say, for a large company or whatever, saying it's bureaucratic, it's stupid, it's all the different ways. It's very easy to get to this emotion. Now, you never start on emotion. You start on having a plan, on something that you understand, how it's going to work and why it's going to work. You don't do it just just for, uh, you know, out of frustration on on, on everything else. The, that's prob probably the, the important thing. Uh, then, uh, then you need to understand the, uh, the time horizon. You need to understand, well, if you start from a very beginning, it's extremely difficult and you have a very, very, very high chance you're going to fail. If you're burning your last bucks doing it, maybe not a good idea. Unless, 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 unless your cost base is zero. Uh, and as, so again, if you want to choose a space, you, you need to choose the space. Like you can be in a corporate side, you will have some degree of security. Also, like just look at the number of layoffs, you may, you may rethink whether you have a degree of security working for a relatively large company. Uh, you can go and start something from absolute scratch. And then you are buying a lottery ticket, however smart you are. You have 99% chance of failure. You have 1% chance of big upside. Uh, in, in, in my case, I get somewhere in between. So I get the business that was early enough that there is a sizable upside and that is already at a stage when you have a reasonable chance of success. So you already get funding being, you know, broadly secured. You already get, you know, some initial work being done. So it's still early, still, you know, a lot of potential but you are somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Now, at this particular stage, I feel more comfortable in this space. Uh, but again, you know, it all depends. And, uh, you know, if I give advice to somebody who is 20 years old and uh, uh, who worst case scenario can go back to his parents' basement, it may be a different uh, uh, risk reward problem. So you really need to, uh, and a lot of like, what you see in entrepreneurship, you see a lot of people who, a very, very big success could start being a dropout out of university and things like it. Now, unfortunately, a lot of dropouts out of universities get nowhere. So like, like Michael, that was a great story. How many people try to, to build something in their dormitories and didn't get to, you know, to it. So you really need to choose. You need to choose what is your priority, what are your values, and then hopefully it will work for you. Very nice. I think uh, we are unfortunately out of time and I would like to take a last few seconds to thank uh, Igor for visiting us today and giving this uh, insightful talk. Um, I learned from this and uh, thank you. Thank you, Igor, once again for uh, sharing uh, your expertise and uh, your wisdom with us. Thank you, Professor Babich, and thank you, Professor Rossi. Thank you so much, Igor. Have a wonderful rest of the day and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.